Well, just for something different uh, to do because it's stormy outside, it's very wet, and we have a big storm coming in uh, tomorrow overnight and tomorrow, and that's Storm Kathleen. So I thought, well, for, I'll do something a little bit unusual for my channel, which is a book review. And the book I'm reviewing, it's one I saw on the shelf. Uh, I was in Dubray Books and I saw it on the shelf there. And I thought, I actually thought it was going to be kind of a bit silly. And it's a, it's called Big Meg. It's a non-fiction book, but I thought it was going to be a little bit, you know, cashing in on the movies and things like that, like the Meg and the Meg 2, <laughs> about the, uh, uh, supposedly about a Megalodon monster. That's a Megalodon shark, which is a, was a monster, apparently, um, getting loose. Uh, from the Marianas Trench and running amok or <laughs> swimming amok on the oceans of the world. But anyhow, this book, uh, when I saw the name I recognised it and there it is, that's Tim Flannery. And it has a beautiful cover but that's just a dust cover, it's one of those really nicely bound books underneath it. Uh, and it's non-fiction and it's Tim Flannery and Emma Flannery, I think I recognised the name Tim Flannery. Uh, he was He's a famous paleontologist. And he's from Australia. I think Emma Flannery could be his wife, his daughter, or his uh, sister, I'm not sure. Even his mother, I'm not quite sure. But he's been going around for a long time, and apparently he's even friends with David Attenborough, who is also a fossil collector. Tim Flannery describes... This is actually a love letter, basically, to the Megalodon, and, and which uh, was... For those who don't know, it's a giant shark. It lived in the... Uh, it lived between about 20 million and up to about 2.5 million years ago some people argue it could be still alive i don't hold that uh, i don't believe that neither does he by the way uh, but he does deal with people who believe such things uh, in the book now for those of you who don't know what a megalodon was um he describes it very nicely he does it both scientifically and then he gets into more peripheral things but also his, his own adventure and how he became interested in megalodon sharks uh, he basically describes how he found his first fossil tooth and the megalodon is basically almost exclusively known from its teeth and the teeth are enormous they were originally thought uh, to belong to a sort of early gray white shark uh, but nobody could understand why the great white shark shrank uh, because the teeth of the megalodon are huge they're much bigger than the great white shark's teeth um, but they're not quite the same and more recently it's been discovered that it wasn't the great white shark it um, many people believe it must have uh, sort of fitted into the same the same kind of niche swimming about in the open ocean and uh, attacking whales and other sharks and things like that but the size of it based on the teeth if it was like a great white shark it would be ridiculously big uh, he says uh, 60 uh, tons basically metric tons 60 metric tons that's uh, 60,000 kilograms for those of you who don't know uh, and uh, about, uh, that's more than half the weight of an of the modern blue whale uh, it would have been between about 30 feet at the lowest, and that would be a small one, to about 72 feet, or 70, maybe up as far as 80 feet long, but 72, anyway, is the maximum range they put it at. But, this is the important thing, uh, the actual shark is only known from its teeth. And he makes the point in the book that originally they thought it was like a great white shark, but things have changed greatly. And um, now the, the, the teeth can be, the fossil teeth are about, the maximum size is 19 centimeters, which is about, it's really big. And they're, they're, they're like jewels, and they're actually kind of considered jewels. And uh, there are collectors, and they are, you can buy them actually from jewelers in many parts of the world, and dealers who deal to jewelers. And uh, depending on where they were fossilized, because they were found all over the planet, it was a very, it seems to have been a very common species. Uh, it's depending on where it's from uh, it kind of fossilized in a different way and some of them have really beautiful uh, patinas like the beautiful colors and things like that um, now here's the interesting thing he tells you a lot in the book and and about the shark and the stats and some of the things are really interesting because he was saying that um, 
if we if we assume it was like a great white shark or filled that kind of niche, even though we know now that great white shark descended from a parallel lineage, and great white sharks even existed at the same time, the later period of uh, megalodon's existence. But even if we consider that, um, it, it it seems to have been a sort of super predator in that it. It, it ate other predatory fish, probably sharks, and, and possibly others of the same species, like cannibalistic. And it also ate uh, almost certainly uh, whales, carnivorous whales. Now the interesting thing is, and this is the weird, there, there are mysteries to this, and I think, I think there's probably going to be an answer, and it's going to be the death knell for the mythology of the megalodon. I don't think it's going to be quite what people thought it was. Uh, and first of all, um, that when they when they compared the uh, nitrogen 15 apparently to nitrogen 14 levels in the teeth, they know that it, it was eating very high quality food. But with the few vertebrae they've managed to find of it, which are very very few and very rare, the studies show that it seemed to it seemed to eat irregularly, as in. It would get a lot of food, and then uh, apparently it would have a slow growth band in it on its uh, vertebrae, and then it would get a lot of food and have a fast growth band, and slow, like kind of like tree rings, like when you were doing dendrochronology. But there'd be a lot of food, and then a long time with very little food. Now I think he says in the book himself, the tooth, the teeth, that the teeth of the the teeth of of the megalodon, the, the they resemble most closely of all the shark species, and those also found in the fossil record, they resemble the cookie cutter shark's teeth. And the cookie cutter shark uh, is a small shark. It's a notorious shark. They do sometimes attack people. They have disproportionately large teeth, and the unusual thing is the big teeth on the cookie cooker shark are actually in the lower jaw the top teeth are for holding and what happens is the cookie cooker sh co cookie cutter sharks sometimes in in groups but uh, usually swim up and ambush an animal and including human beings they bite a chunk out of you and the chunk is at five centimeters in width and seven centimeters deep on average there's two species one is the small tooth cookie cooker well small tooth small proportionally and the other one's the large tooth which has ridiculously big teeth for its mouth now i think it's going to turn out that uh i just for fun i decided to measure it, like assume it's a cookie cutter shark that megalodon was a cookie cutter shark uh, it it makes a lot of sense because two things happened that are very interesting. Whales evolved in the period of the Megalodon. And not just did whales evolve, but there were whales everywhere. And in the tropics there were small whales that did very well. But not only were there small whales, but seals took to the water. The ancestors of seals took to the water and evolved into swimming creatures. Now, you need a little bit of say you need a little bit of space to do that with no without being predated so it suggests that th this shark wasn't predating them or, or not to the levels that you would expect they, they were in fact he said tim flannery says in his book one of the great problems with the this shark is that if it was like a gray white shark and there were so many of them as the fossil record suggests it's impossible to imagine how there was enough food for them like because literally they were so big and they would have been warm blooded so they would have had to have been eating non-stop but the evidence suggests they didn't eat non-stop and therefore they were probably cold blooded and if they were like a cookie cutter shark they would swim up when at a certain point when they were hungry take a chunk out of some big animal swim back down into the depths and stay out of harm's way now at the same time that the megalodon existed there was another creature and that creature was a type of whale and it's actually seems to be a direct ancestor of the modern sperm whale now the modern sperm whale was a specialist feeder and uh, as we know like it, it feeds on squid but it dives deep very very deep to kill uh, giant squid and even it seems probably colossal squid as well and the marks are often left the injuries on the uh, whale this ancient sperm whale which had teeth both in its upper jaws and lower jaws and was more powerfully built it was like a large modern sperm whale not it wouldn't be probably as large as the largest modern sperm whales have been recorded 
but it had very big teeth, powerful jaws, and they're sort of like longer versions of the teeth you would find on, say, an orca, and it, but they were more splayed out, more like a crocodile's teeth, but I think they were actually, they'd evolved to grab something that will, might escape. I suspect, I strongly suspect, this uh, whale, which is known as Leviathan, which was, uh, it's like Leviathan, but it's it's the original Hebrew pronunciation, so it's Leviathan, and it's a uh, Hebrew. Um, well, it, I think that it probably hunted, a, some. it could have actually hunted deep sea sharks or some other species, maybe even squid that don't exist anymore. But whatever it hunted, on one occasion for sure, um, a megalodon actually bit into its jaw. Now it's possible it was sleeping and the megalodon came up and bit it on the face. It was unusual where it bit it. Uh, but I suspect it was probably hunting the megalodon and the megalodon turned and bit at it. Now, you, you're probably still imagining a gigantic shark. I don't think it was nearly as big. Uh, taking the cookie, cookie cutter shark uh, as my... Um, I would call it uh, uh, as the classic example. I just, uh, f just to see how it panned out. I uh, comparing the teeth, the fossilized teeth of cookie cooker shark with uh, a megalodon shark and scaling it up. Uh, I came out with um, if it was a direct scale and it was like the length of, of like say the cookie cutter was the length of a megalodon, or the length, say a cookie cutter shark had teeth the size of a megalodon. Um, then the cookie cutter shark will be about 25 feet long and maybe 20 or to 27 feet long Which isn't gigantic because their teeth are huge. They're in fact their teeth are so are massive and they haven't got as many of them as say a great white shark would have They have about 32 I think 26 to 32 in their jaw and that's the lower jaw They have smaller teeth on top uh, which they grab on with now the megalodon seems to have had those kind of grabby teeth as well but we tend to look at the megalodon's jaws the other way around, like the big teeth kind of on top. Um, but they might actually have been on the bottom. And kind of like the cookie cutter shark, a kind of a, like a, an ice cream scoop, except scooping into flesh and scooping into the fat of whales. The teeth are exactly identical, only in the size difference. So, what I didn't do though, is I didn't factor in the fact that what you usually get when creatures get bigger, they don't tend to go like a if a creature is double the size it doesn't tend to be double the length it tends to be shorter just stockier so it's very possible that a cookie cutter shark or a or that our shark that feeds like that growing to that to feed in that way uh, and having a bite radius say of uh, 80 centimeters or which is about ooh, what's that it's just two two just over two feet um so it's not gigantic, even it's about the size of a really big grey white shark uh, bite. But uh, the difference is that uh, it will be a very deep bite, biting into flesh. And it would only be taking a chunk of flesh and swimming off with it. That would be enough to live on. Which would explain why there are lots of megalodons, because they didn't need to eat as much if they were cold-blooded. They could just live off that for months, go into the deep sea or somewhere away from, from uh, other, other predators. And... Um, digest it and then come back up grab another bite like a modern cookie cutter shark does but if they were kind of really large but stocky they might actually have been only about 15 to 20 feet long so that would explain a lot that would explain they were getting enough food why there were loads of them why they had massive teeth um that they we know they preyed on whales because fossil whales have been found with their teeth stuck in them fossil bones of whales but those whales might have been um dead already they could have been scavenging them because cookie cutter sharks scavenge as well they they eat from uh, carcasses of whales and things like that uh, they they're known of course to bite and i mean one unfortunate person was standing in the surf and had a chunk taken out of their backside by a cookie cutter shark it was five centimeter <laughs> diameter bite they do this to dolphins a lot uh, particularly around Hawaii or any islands that where that are in deep water where the island is kind of jutting up they uh, they swim up from the depths uh, they bite when they're hungry and then they swim back down. They seem to live for ages off what they eat. So they only kind of need one big bite. Uh, and so that would explain in why the peculiarities, seals are evolving at the same time. 
because seals probably wouldn't have been predated by them too much but whales if there were lots and lots of whales all over the place and every kind of whales and other sea mammals they evolved to feed on sea mammals but they didn't eat, have to eat every sea mammal going and they weren't warm blooded they could go back into the sea and into the depths and live for months before eating again and that makes more sense because even by um, one of the biggest problems with the current uh, notions of the of the megalodon is that it, uh, it's like a great white shark and it was hot blooded. It had to keep eating massive, massive amounts of food, and yet there were so many of them. How did they? How on earth did they live for uh, you know 20 million years nearly without um, going extinct? Like well, from lack of food, <laughs> they would have eaten everything, and there were even the small ones would have eaten pretty big things. So it's beginning to look like that. The explosion in whales and marine mammals coincided or actually caused these creatures to be able to find a niche which was that they could, there was lots of food to eat. They didn't exhaust their food supply. And the funny thing is, at around the time the megalodon declines, like in the fossil record, uh, that's just prior to the first big ice age, first major ice age uh, of the modern, of the most recent ice age uh, events. Uh, it's, it could be due to cooling. Uh, there's, it seems that tropical species of whales decrease. They're not the fossil record becomes quite thin on the ground, and then it seems that uh, it seems that uh, the big whales migrated into the colder t uh, climates. And we know that uh, cookie cutter sharks are mostly found around the tropics today, around the uh, equator area. Um, so they and they don't their bites don't seem to be turning up on in the ice cold seas of the Arctic or Antarctic so it looks like they're quite a tropical creature and it's probably the same for the megalodon that it was a tropical creature and while there was lots of tropical whales around to feed on uh, there were lots of them but then when when the whales of the tropical zone start, started to disappear which was at the same time that great white sharks started to appear and at the same time that the orca started to appear like in, in big numbers and it seems that at that at that point um, there was such a change that uh, the leviathan sperm whale basically evolved into the modern sperm whale and started to specialize in, in squid deep sea and it had to dive very very deep ridiculously deep so this is a beautiful book. I suggest everybody or anybody with an interest in Megalodon, you mightn't agree with what I'm saying there, but it does account for a lot of the strange things that are turning up. A lot of the things he talks about in this that don't make sense. This, but at the same time, there's the romance of this giant shark out there and which has got into movies and all. But obviously there's such quirky things that don't make sense that I think, I, I would say that if a fossil is ever found of, a, of an actual megalodon and it might be only a small specimen or whatever but if they ever find a fossil of it I think they're going to find something like a cookie cutter shark something with a much smaller mouth than was imagined with lots of big teeth in it something probably specializing in eating uh, biting chunks one big chunk out of something and swimming off and living off that for a long long time in a cold-blooded way in, in the cold depths of the tropics or the colder depths of the tropics not necessarily cold by antarctic or arctic uh, ideas of cold and I, I think that's what's going to happen that will be the result but read this book it's incredible he talks about paleontology talks about the whole industry involved in in uh, and the beautiful kinds it's only a shame there are no illustrations other than the, the spectacular cover illustration there's a nice little illustration here of a shark fin but um, other than that, uh, it, it's devoid of them. It could really do with some, you know, photos, color photos of uh, of the different kinds of megalodon too. I mean, they're all kind of the same species, but just to see, and also have photos. Although, <coughs> excuse me. Although, it may give the game away if you actually see a cookie cutter shark, a fossilized cookie cutter shark too, and compare it to. Uh, uh, fossilized megalodon tooth. I, I, I mean, that's the thing. So I, I think what happened to megalodon actually, uh, it, it died out because its 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 food went. And in fact, even if it had survived into the relatively recent era, 
human beings had such a detrimental effect on whales and, and nearly wiped so many of them out that they would have it would have starved to death from what we did uh, we would have actually driven it to extinction because our, the whale numbers were so few uh, during the, the year of whaling like, which was 500 years nearly of uh, well particularly the last 300 years where it was out of all control so yeah so there you go that's but i recommend you read this book he tells you everything about it including how megalodon teeth were used to uh try and just tell you whether or not there's poison in your food in in the renaissance times and uh other things like he tells all sorts of things and lots of quirky facts about megalodon tooth hunters and extraordinary characters who jump into shark infested waters today uh, and looking for teeth uh, and, and, and all. it's amazing like and, and incredible adventures and people you've never heard of who live very adventurous lives uh, and of course David Attenborough gets in here as well because David Attenborough is a friend of his and also a paleontologist a, a collector of fossils uh, I myself have only very uh, I'm very new to that whole thing I don't collect fossils or anything but I found it lovely and very interesting to read about other people that do and uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of adventure out there, and um, but at the same time, this could be the soliloquy for the for the the, the big Meg. There may not have been a big Meg, uh, in which case, of course, um, that would mean that there will be some other monster we have to dream up, <laughs> and some other monster people will have to hunt for. That doesn't mean that there there might not be gigantic sharks, as I said. There have been sightings of gigantic sharks, gigantic white, uh, all white sharks, probably deep sea sharks. And when I was talking about, I uh, I never thought it was a megalodon, but reports of giant white coloured sharks seem to suggest some sort of creature that feeds on uh, shellfish and uh, and actually crab and, and uh, seems to be attracted to that and rarely but occasionally being seen but also there could be other creatures out there we, we I mean it's still a big deep ocean you don't necessarily need the megalodon there's lots and lots of possibility out there but anyway regardless whether you agree with me or not have a look at the book uh, think about what he says like because he doesn't he's not making the case for that at all I'm just making the case based on what he says on the data that it does seem to me that the megalodon was basically a gigantic cookie cutter shark but gigantic only in, <laughs> in in being about the size of a modern gray white shark <laughs>